Hello and welcome to Lightmap from Sifter. On Lightmap, we explore what it takes to make video games and interactive media from creative teams all around the world. My name is Adam. Thank you for joining me. Every episode, you get to meet new developers, artists, musicians, researchers, creatives, writers, and more. This week on Lightmap, my guest is Dr. Brendan Keogh, a senior lecturer at the School of Communication at Queensland University of Technology. He is a game maker and has written about the culture and creation and development of games as a medium for Overland, The Conversation, Polygon, Vice, and more. Brendan's latest book, The Video Game Industry Does Not Exist, Why We Should Rethink Beyond Commercial Game Production, is out now from MIT Press. He joins me shortly to unpack it all with me. But before we get into that, let's have a look at the news this week on Walkthrough, Sifter's weekly news podcast. Hi, I'm Kyle Paletto. And I'm Fiona Bartholomew. And here are the top stories this week on Walkthrough, Sifter's weekly news podcast for Sunday, 7th of May. Xbox's Phil Spencer says Redfall launch was disappointing and promises fixes. Zelda Tears of the Kingdom has leaked as retailers break street date and a ROM is posted online. A Finnish newspaper is using a CSGO custom map to avoid Russian censorship about the war in Ukraine. And Citizen Sleeper, the hit sci-fi RPG, gets a tabletop adaptation. You can get every episode of Walkthrough for free on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or on our website, sifter.com.au, every Sunday. All right, we're back on Lightmap, and joining me this week is Dr. Brennan Keo. Welcome to the show. How are you going? And thank you so much for this incredible book. It's been really wonderful to read through it. The Video Game Industry Does Not Exist is the name of it. And I think we might as well start there. And why not like unpack that core thesis? What is the video game industry and why doesn't it exist? Yeah, well, yeah, look, thanks for having me. The book came out last week. It's been an amazing reception so far. Um, it's open access on, sorry, this isn't an answer to your question. It's open access online, which means people are just reading it rather than waiting for it to be shipped and then sending me a letter six months later. So that's been really amazing. Uh, the video game industry doesn't exist. Uh, why is it called that? So the whole idea of a book is essentially to make an intervention in how we talk about where video game making happens and who does it. Um, when I talk about game development, game making with people who maybe aren't super familiar with what game making is um, or what even games look like, you know, like talking to parents or whatnot, there's often... When, when people think about games, they just think about, well, cliche, they just think about AAA or they just think about AAA or those kind of big time indie developers making millions of dollars and enough to actually get on the ABC News to actually talk about this new Minecraft developer or what have you. So, but when we talk about like music or when we talk about acting or theatre or poetry or writing novels, like we know that's not actually how art happens at if video games are art, that must mean a lot of people aren't making very much money doing it because that's how art operates under capitalism. Some some people make a lot of money and a lot of people make very little or no money. So the idea of this book is like, hey, what we call the video game industry isn't actually the full extent of where game making happens or who does it. That if games are actually art, as a lot of us like to you know, say over and over again as some kind of refrain, then what does it actually mean for the people who make them, where they're making them, what kind of communities, what kind of scenes, what kind of little teams or solo groups, and that if we really want to understand game making, we need to understand that broader stuff beyond just companies with an ABN number. Mm, I really like the way that you say that this is an intervention about the way that we talk about games. And I, I, I think about this all the time from a slightly different perspective, that on the kind of cultural critique side of things, where it's... You know, I like to play a lot of video games, then I like to culturally critique them and explore them. And, you know, there is so many different like ways that people approach games. And I, I find that we still find ourselves falling into this mindset of talking about them as 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 a product first or as as consumer um, critique first. It's like, is this worth your money to purchase rather than what is this piece of art trying to say about the world? What is it trying to explore? What are the themes behind it? What is the deeper meaning of the thing that you're playing? Um, and it, it's interesting because, you know, I feel like we are in this place for a particular reason and the opening chapters of your book really try to set that up. And you, you've you've kind of hinted at this already with the idea of like big companies with an ABN dictate the way that we talk about games right now as like um, a product or as like a, a big thing that you kind of go work for a studio or whatever, the Nintendos, the Microsofts, et cetera. 
why did that end up that way? How did we end up in this place that this is how we perceive the video game industry? Yeah, totally. I think, God, it was such, the worst thing about choosing this title is I just can't say video game industry anywhere in a book, and that was a massive challenge. Um, I really screwed myself over with that one. We can use the wonderful term that you've used throughout, which is the in uh, forward slash formalized video game field, which I think is a really great term to kind of totally great great in writing less useful in our spoken podcast um yeah look how did we get in this place something i'd like to say and it's almost a claim you can't really disagree with but i think is actually really challenging to how we think about this stuff is that video game development had to exist before there was a video game industry like there had to be this kind of cultural practice of making video games that could be industrialized um and a lot of us know those narratives already from students hacking big army computers on university bases to make games like space war or just in their own time making little tennis for two games and then it's you know the big companies like atari or whoever else was around back then i'm blanking um who were like hey these things these people made are really interesting i reckon we could make money with that and so then you have um what was the commercial version of space war i've lost the name of it now but like, you know, you've got the commercialized version of these, these things are just people made, students, amateurs, tinkerers, etc. And so the video game industry came after video game development. Like there is video game development before there is a video game industry. And so through the 70s and 80s, this is a very crude, broad history. And there's obviously a lot of nuance to this. 70s and 80s, you know, you had microcomputers, you had all sorts of ways to make games. Um, you know, if you could write in basic, you could make games. And really, if you wanted to play a game, often you had to make the game first. You got the magazine that had the, lo- the page of code in it and you wrote it out into your computer and then you made the game to play. So playing and making were much, much more aligned. And then something shifted in how the video game industry worked in the late 80s and forever 90s, which I call in the book aggressive formalization, which is essentially we had the big crash around ET that a lot of us probably know, you know, Atari fell apart. Um, mm, the infamous a- video game crash that led to, yeah, like landfills of, of game cartridges being dumped into, into trash totally. heaps. Yeah. And there's broader reasons that happened. And it was really just the North American console game crash. A lot of historians like to point out, you know, microcomputer games in the UK were fine. But it, it really impacted the narrative of how the game industry operates and what mistakes you shouldn't make. So when Nintendo entered the field and other Japanese companies afterwards, the idea the idea was that we had that big crash because there was a glut of bad quality products and consumers don't trust what they're getting. So Nintendo introduced, you know, the Nintendo seal of approval, had really strict editorial guidelines that if you want to get on the NES, you need to have no sex, no violence, et cetera, et cetera, or else we won't give you the software development kit you need. So another academic, Casey O'Donnell, has explored this really incredibly in his book, The Developer's Dilemma, um, which I found hugely inspiring. And he pointed out for Nintendo, there was kind of legal marketing and creative kind of decisions made to kind of give the public a very specific idea of what games are and where they come from so that people would actually just trust Nintendo. And following from that, you've got, um, you know, Sega and Sony forever following years doing similar things. But you've also got the formation of gamer culture, right? The gamer becomes a deliberately manufactured target audience of games are no longer just for families, they're for young adolescent men. And the young adolescent man becomes a stable demographic to keep advertising to, which I often think of as like how the Wiggles always will have new five-year-olds, right? Like they don't, the Wiggles don't need to write new songs every year. There will always just be another generation of five-year-olds they can play the same songs for. Similarly, the game industry... Um, can just make another Call of Duty, another shooter. There'll always be another 15-year-old male to age into that demographic. So a lot of things happen at once. Um, The stabilization of the young gamer dude who loves gameplay as this kind of defining feature. The games become defined by um, increasingly advanced technology with the technological arms race, especially around the introduction of 3D. And this idea that you need to trust the industry to make the good games for a consumer because that massive glut of amateur games led to the crash of the industry. And so what happened there is you have about 20 odd years where it's these large companies that effectively control the discourse about what games are, what a good game is, 
how games are made. This is what gameplay is versus this is what graphics are. Um, and we ended up with these ideas that games are about choice, games are about interactivity, good visuals are realistic visuals, um, as opposed to, say, stylistic ones. And all of that, like saying now, like all of this sounds kind of, well, that's not what it's like anymore. Because, um, I mean, since about the mid-2000s, the rise of high-speed internet, it has changed dramatically. Um, but definitely for about, there were 20-odd very formative years where video game development became imagined by society as a very specific, very commercial thing. And it became very difficult to imagine non-commercial game development or more creative artistic stuff happening outside of that industry. Mm. And it feels like in a way, once that narrative started to shift, we then got a different narrative, which was the idea of the idealistic sort of indie games developer that, you know, I think is mentioned quite a few times by some of the interviewees in this book, particularly people talk about indie game, the movie, as, and looking at that going, well, this isn't why I make games or why I create art. I'm not hoping to kind of like get onto the top sale of Steam and get that one in a million chance to kind of create my version of Fez or, or Braid. <laughs> and so it, it's, it's almost like we have a another narrative kind of at play there about like what is an indie game and what is an acceptable indie game in, in a lot of ways too. Totally. Yeah, so that's the next part of the narrative then around the mid-2000s, the rise of indie and as like indie game for movie shows, which I'm not sure of many pieces of media that have aged as badly as indie game for movie, uh, where it's just a bunch of white dudes, right, making, but not, not even necessarily innovating per se, but just making the games they grew up with. Um, or crudely, like Fez, I love Fez, I think it's amazing, um, and Super Meat Boy as well, but it's not, it, it's it's less going, the games they're making are still relatively conventional, just conventional from 10, 15, 20 years earlier. So, but that became possible because for rise of high-speed internet, you no longer needed to go for a publisher to get on a console, you could now just release your game online and people could access it. Um as, as a standalone game, obviously modding existed in the 90s, which is a whole nother thing, which I won't spend 20 minutes on. But um, so then that happened. But I think the critique of the, the original kind of wave of indie, on the one hand, it was great. It was like there's a lot more freedom, a lot more autonomy. People can make smaller games, cheaper games, games that seem exciting that aren't just trying to be Call of Duty 28 or Assassin's Creed 52 or whatever. Um, but then the critique of that became it still required relatively advanced kind of programming and computer skills like to actually still make a game. And what happened, I guess, in the 2010s, more than the 2000s, was the rise of much more accessible game-making tools, um, Unity being the obvious one. Um, Flash was before that, but could, was obviously limited in what kinds of games it could make. But the rise of Unity, at the other end of the spectrum, the rise of Twine for interactive fiction work, you essentially, in the 2010s, especially the early 2010s, you didn't just see a wider range of games being made, but a wider range of types of people making games. And so these different people had very different ambitions for what they were trying to achieve with these games, not necessarily the same old white dudes who really want to work in the game industry because they grew up playing Mario, but maybe um, a trans woman who's a poet who just is exploring different ways that interactivity might help them make poetry or what have you. Um or so just a whole range of different demographics who may or may not have grown up with video games exploring the medium of video games in different ways because suddenly the the tools of production have become so much more accessible and so i think as a field we were like 2012 i kind of put down as like the year that everyone had to start like we had walking simulators we had twine games we had all these games that were getting massive critical acclaim which radically challenged everything we'd kind of people like me had grown up to be told what a good video game was like games where you're not making choices games where you're where there isn't any action you're just moving around or games who, um that don't even have graphics or don't even have gameplay as we understood it yet they were clearly really good video games so it kind of forced a lot of us to reassess the limits we'd kind of imposed on the field up to that point and to say oh Maybe there's something more than this that we haven't really accounted for yet. Mm, I, I kind of remember that that era quite a lot as well. That sort of shift towards people exploring things like Gone Home, 
uh, Dear Esther. Um, I think about Papers, Please as well, all coming out of that period. But I also think of things that came a few years after that, like Butterfly Soup, for example, like the rise of the visual novel as like a, a really important place for queer creators as well. Because essentially it's, uh, you know, moving the idea of creative writing and storytelling in a different format that's a bit more interactive, but, you know, not quite like fully interactive like we would expect in say like an assassin's creed as you as you kind of put it that triple a idea of what a game is um with that shift uh you've what we're talking about an intervention of how we speak about games and and how we approach games there's a lot of terminology and language within this book that i really really enjoyed the idea of like how do we talk about the people that make games are they a video game developer or are they a game maker um uh you know it's we go back to that idea of like i do you identify with the term gamer or not which you know makes me want to kind of crawl under my desk and die when i think about it but definitely at the same time i play a whole bunch of triple a games but i don't find that that definition fits into who i am as a person when it comes to kind of interactive media and i guess like interactive storytelling and what i get out of it as as, as someone who likes to interact with this sort of art form um i'm kind of curious when you were doing your interviews with various developers at what point did you realize that you would have to kind of uh kind of unpack the term video game developer and and then kind of re-extrapolate the different ways that we could sort of explore how we like identify someone who makes games and 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 what that term could actually be and how much broader it could be. Yeah, totally. Um, look, probably before I started speaking to people, honestly, it was something I was very much thinking about in terms of who do I speak to or who do I approach? And for, so I did, I interviewed about 200 developers and I also put out a big survey online and asked people to fill it out. And so the survey is probably where this question came up most challenging for me. Um, the main theorist I use of a book, um, Pierre Bordeaux, a, a dead French dude, um, who talks about cultural fields and I use his theory a lot. He's got this great sentence in one of his articles I use, which I think I quote in a book where he says like, any attempt to survey the field inevitably like delimits what it thinks the field is. Um, and I think of that when I try like, so I've talked at GDC before and I every year get the GDC email, hey, we want you to fill out the state of the industry survey um as you know as a developer and i've released my own small solo dev games in a hobbyist capacity um and they clearly want me to fill it out they email me and ask me to and i start filling it out and it says how many people work at your studio or what is your income and tick boxes from like forty thousand dollars or whatever and i'm like i sit on my couch while my partner watches netflix and make games on a macbook when i want to around a full-time academic job so I get halfway through it. I'm like, I'm clear. I feel like I shouldn't be filling this out. Like I'm muddying the waters. Um, so that who are you even talking to and how are you legitimizing or illegitimizing them? Even at that early stage of asking them to fill out your survey is something I was thinking about a lot. And when I did release my survey, I ended up with this incredibly bloated kind of phrasing, which was like, I want you to fill out this survey. If you are, what did I say? if you are involved in the making of video games in Australia, I think, if I said an Australian game maker, then they'll be like, oh, well, maybe they're not an Australian citizen. If I said game developer, a lot of people associate developer with the software side, or maybe they're like, I don't make video games, I make interactive novels. So there's all these complications about how you can accidentally include and not include people. So in my survey, I was like, are you involved in the making of games? So that would be more inclusive. With my interviews, I guess I'm relatively, I, f I feel like I have a pretty good understanding of the Australian video game field, who's around. I lived in Melbourne for a few years. I've been active as a games journalist before my academic life. So um, I tweet too much. I, I feel like I know who's around and what they're doing, not just in the academics, sorry, not just in the commercial um, circles, but in the, I guess the arty and the hobbyist and the student circles as well. So for my interviews, I just deliberately reached out to people that would not normally be reached out to for a kind of industry research, right? I didn't just go to the large studios or the commercial indie studios. I deliberately reached out to someone I knew was a hobbyist making weird stuff or um, my own students or students at other universities. Um, and people certainly were like, oh, I don't know if I've got anything useful to say. So I had to do a lot of work encouraging them to speak to me. But so the methodology I use, you know, interviews and surveys, that's exactly what they're useful for. They're not going to tell me there are this many game developers in Australia and this is the demographic breakdown 
you know, qualitative research doesn't tell you that, but it does allow you to kind of drill into the specifics of like, well, here is this person who is a poet in Adelaide who sometimes uses Bitsy. Let's see what they think about game development. Yeah, and I I think it's really important that we actually capture those people and start to see them as people that create games. Um, Because when I think a lot about like, you know, for me personally, I find video games and games to kind of sit within the cultural space that I would say like performing arts or visual arts. It's an extension of those, but like film requires sometimes lots of people to deliver one piece of art or like theater as well. There is a team behind the piece that kind of gets made sometimes. Um, And it's interesting when I try to think about those sorts of questions in a creative arts context, And you kind of think of surveying people that work in, say, performing arts, for example, and it's like, do you do anything in the performing arts? I feel like people would have no problem identifying very quickly, yet there's something about um, the game creation um, process or being a video game creator that... Yeah, that that process that you've identified, that sort of myth-making of the video game industry as this big hierarchical sort of thing controlled by big organizations and that you kind of go to university, you get your degree in coding and using a game engine and off you go to work on Assassin's Creed has sort of muddied the waters of how we can talk about this thing as an artistic practice i mean like in my mind i think of a game creator and i'm like you're like a sculptor basically (laughs) or or someone who does pottery it's like you might be successful and like have an incredible line of pottery that people want or no one might ever know that you made some 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 like cups that sit in your house or whatever and it's it's hard to sort of unpack that and well that's a it's a broader challenge for like artists generally right like you know are you an artist you probably many people may not feel comfortable owning that label but i always think like to me i just always go to the analogy of musicians like are you a musician it's like if you play guitar you're you're a musician right like um i I feel like it doesn't have the necessarily the same level of um insecurity or, or aggression policing around it let's say whereas like yeah like game developer has that right if you're not exactly like you're saying so I always come back to music analogies because in terms of how we understand both the formal, informal, the amateur, the professional, I feel like we have a pretty good understanding of how that works in the music space. Yeah, and and I really appreciate that comparison as well, coming from a background of having worked within the music industry. And I use air quotes for that too because the music industry, like the games industry, sort of doesn't exist but sort of does. Um, And there is this sort of like myth-making about record labels and about success and about like... The, the small 1% of successful big artists that sort of make it. And then the idea of just all these disparate subcultures, there is not like one music scene in a city. There are dozens, if not hundreds in a city like Melbourne, there are dozens of dozens of subcultures within one genre of music. And I really like that there's an entire chapter in this book dedicated to unpacking the idea of what is a game scene? What does that look like? How um, how many scenes can be layered on top of each other and talk to each other or not even have a connection with each other? And I think it's something that, you know, we're still in this homogenized way of talking about games as an art form that, you know, we're still kind of doing that thing where we look at them and go, graphics are a seven, gameplay is a six. Overall, it's a seven point, you know, it's that sort of cultural critique that we still seem to be at. And I think that conversation kind of hampers the way that we can talk about the people who then make these things or participate in the making of them as well. Totally. And part of that is I think that, again, we're still trying to get out of the legacy of those decades of really um, narrowed ideas of imagined ideas of what game making even is and who even does it. So when that was really dominated by your Nintendo, Sega, Sony, etc., we're still kind of dealing with a long tail of that of entire generations who think of games first as only like entertainment software for teenagers and toys. Or we like to complain about how people don't really get video games are really art, but the industry, which I say doesn't exist, like kind of did that to itself, right? Over decades of telling everyone games were entertainment products for kids. Uh, look, I think you summed it up really nicely there. Um, I kind of want to go into your description of the the field of teaching people how to make games because uh, there is a chapter in this book which paints a really 
dare I say it, stark picture of the way that education institutions across this country and across the world um, attract people to the craft of game making and the expectations of what people will get out of a degree when they sign up for a course um, and where like games creation fits within like an educational framework. Like, is this STEM work? Is this like coding and computer science or is this more within the realm of humanities and social sciences should we be thinking about like film studies and screen studies and media studies and cultural critique when we go into creating video games like is this art school or is this i'm doing a science degree um and I'm really curious to unpack this because obviously you have a background as an educator that teaches students and you talk a lot in this book about like the people that um uh, marketed to join these courses are usually people that have grown up with a lifelong hobby or interest in the playing of games, but not necessarily in the idea of getting involved in the practice of working in a creative field where you're making art. And some of the tensions that then come out of that process of then educating someone into the process of, well, actually, you're here to learn how to make art. Um, tell me about how that all works and, and what it feels like. Yeah, it's, it's a big, big, complicated area. I'll try not to talk for half an hour. Um, I, get, I guess, like, firstly, I should probably stress, like, tr for transparency reasons, my own biases, both in terms of coming from a cultural studies background and also doing creative writing undergrad. I have very strongly held specific ideas of how I think this should work, and a computer programming lecturer would probably have a very different idea. But for me, it's – so I did – in my undergrad, I did an arts degree. I did – I majored in creative writing, did a bunch of poetry – in no way thought I'm going to get a job as a poet. It just wasn't going to happen. But I studied poetry because I really liked writing and I wrote poems. I think I won one, I won one poem award, so I got 200 bucks out of it. And then I did you know, narrative writing, I did screen writing, and then I spent my years after my degree working at Woolworths and doing creative writing on a live journal or whatever, just trying to get it out there. And eventually that writing ability, those skills, essentially got me a job in, got me into postgraduate and got me into a job in academia and in games journalism because I could write, right? I had, a, I had a transferable skill. So when it comes to game development, because historically we haven't thought of it as part of the art space alongside music, creative writing, et cetera, we've thought of it as kind of a software industry or a, a high money-making entertainment industry. Historically, it was kind of the STEM disciplines and faculties, the computer science schools, the information technology faculties. In a lot of universities, they were like, cool, we'll teach that. And, you know, it wasn't the, the poets and the literary professors who were like, oh, we should teach games. It was the game and nerd computer science lecturers who were like, we should teach games. And that makes total sense. But it kind of means we've kind of got this historical legacy of games of a university as, as a tech thing, not as an arts thing. And that happens within the broader social context of the government drastically defunding um, universities, this broader social idea of universities is about developing job-ready graduates as opposed to just increasing your ability to democratically participate in society, which is what universities should be, but also kind of requires university A to be free and for you to not need to have a job while you're at university, which university in this country hasn't been for quite a long time. So on the one hand, you have academics like me just wanting to teach a creative skill and a culture like help kids learn a creative practice around being a game maker. On the other hand, you have the institution, the university institution, being like games make billions of dollars a year, um, join this high-tech workforce, you love playing games, so maybe you should also love making games. And so what you end up with on day one um, of class is a bunch of gamers who have never made a game or even thought about making a game in their life but love playing them. Not, not only have, well, they haven't they thought about making one, because of those ideas we've previously talked about, these narrow ideas of what even is legitimate video game development, they don't think they can make one until they go to university and get told how to make one. Yeah, and I think there's also this this other element of like the, the big formalized game industry, as we like to imagine it, are pretty secretive in their processes. It's very hard to actually find out a lot of the times how these games are made, the, the creative process within the studios, the amount of NDAs and secrecy that goes into the production process. So a lot of this is like obscured for fans of those big blockbuster games or it must seem like some sort of magical machine is churning out these sort of wonderful power fantasies for people to play um but there isn't really like 
an idea of how it's made in the way that, say, cinema is now, where people understand an idea of what the role of a director is. For better or not, auteur theory, theory has done its thing where people go to, you know, you need to become a director and, and feel like they have an idea of what they're kind of getting into. Totally. And, like, there's nothing wrong with going to uni as a music student being like, I'm going to be a rock star. Like, you can have that dream. But, like, but you also, I think, if you're going into music, you're going into poetry, you have that dream, you have the aspiration, but you probably have a little bit of sense of reality as well. Whereas game development is like, yeah, you don't know how they're made necessarily. And that's been one of the biggest great things about the rise of indie, the rise of Twitter. We do now see more and more people just tweeting out GIFs of glitches, even at the AAA level, right? That secrecy has kind of deteriorated a bit in a really fruitful way. Um, but yeah, but like uh, one of my the, um, educators I spoke to used a really great analogy of... Um, Mad Max Fury Road, where like I don't know any, I don't know anything about making films, like not a thing. But like I watch Mad Max Fury Road, and I'm like, they, they had to take a bunch of cars out into the desert and crash them. That's clearly a lot of work. All those all those people are real people. They needed makeup. They needed stunt doubles. They needed to flip these cars around. Like I can see the labor essentially. In games, you can't see the labor unless you know what you're looking for. It's all just virtual, right? Like. And, and games, through those decades of aggressive formalization, where, when realism was kind of the thing with that the industry was aiming for, did a lot of work to hide the labor that, like, if, if it's super realistic, you can't actually see the, the fingerprints of the developers on it. Glitches were bad things. We still see that the way often speedrunners talk about games are often, like, you know, breaking games or sometimes you get, like, the lazy developer discourse still. And it's like, no, that's just like, you look at a painting and you see the fingerprints or you see the strokes, like, or you listen to the music recording where you can hear them chatting in the background between songs. Like, that's such an important part of the art. But in games, we often, until really very recently, we've lacked the kind of creator's fingerprints because of the virtualness of it. And so students really struggle with that. They come in and they don't, they don't actually know what it takes to make a game because they haven't actually seen the materiality of a game in the game engine before. One of the students I spoke to just had this amazing reflection about he was a third year student and he was reflecting back to when he first started and had this realization he couldn't just like drag and drop bullets in and they would work, that he had to like create physics first um, or tell the bullet what happens when you hit a, a stone wall, what happens when you hit a player, when you hit an enemy, when like you have to, you have to create the problems before you can solve the problems essentially. Yeah, I I love that example as well because when I when I hear you describe that, it it creates this image in my head of like this absolute sense of freedom of like the sky is the limit of where you can go with creativity within these tools. Um, whereas I feel like that developer was probably coming, that student in particular was probably like, oh wow, I had no idea how much labor was behind getting a a bullet to go from left to right. And and you just think about like the Matrix or any of these kind of popular culture ways we imagine virtual worlds. You're like load in a helicopter tap 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 there's the helicopter but it's like i didn't have a z-axis in this game because i didn't know i could i would have flying in it and now everything's broken i kind of want to almost step out even further now um in january this year we had prime minister anthony albanese come out and say art jobs are real jobs and in, in what was one of the biggest creative arts federal policy shakeups that we've seen in years in this country how do you think this is going to help um, people that are creating games, that are making games in Australia? And, and where do you see that um, tying into the future of, of the various game scenes and, and maker scenes in, in this country? Yeah, great question. Um, yeah, look, it's a challenging one. So we've got the new cultural policy. It's incredibly um, promising that we have it and massive step forward after over a decade of the arts broadly not being looked after at all in this country. Um, you know, in fact, it's called Revive, a very kind of subtle... Um, nod to the fact that the last cultural policy was the previous Labor government very long ago. Um, the artists, is, the, the, the pillar of that cultural policy about acknowledging art jobs as, as real jobs or the artist as a worker is obviously a direct kind of response to like Morrison and his ill kind of, there was that claim that Morrison made at one point when he finally begrudgingly announced art sector funding during the pandemic. And he was like, oh, this, don't worry, this funds just as much for the tradies you know, doing the set design as it is for the artists. Like, don't worry, we're not just giving artists money. We will also give money for real jobs. And this is clearly a response to that. It's like, no, making art is a real job. It creates real value for society. Um, it, and and what, I, what I want to see out of that and what the cultural policy seems to promisingly say 
is not just that like, art jobs are real jobs insofar as an artist can also go and make an advertisement or a um I don't know, a sculptor could also go and engineer a bridge, like not just yeah, because- or, a, or a musician might have their creative project, but also they're a session muso. So they play a bunch of Muzak recordings. <laughs> totally. But what, what's, what's promising about appreciating the artist as a worker in, in their own right is not thinking about they will also make economic value over there, but the thing they do as artists is itself important, valuable work, whether that's telling stories about how we understand ourselves as a culture or like critiquing power or whatever it is. Um, what I also hope it includes, and I'll get to games in a sec, is what, what I try, I guess one of the main points of a book is that if we're going to understand games as art or games as a cultural sector, that means accounting for the complex way work actually works in the cultural sector, which means a lot of it is unpaid, a lot of it is unreliable and precarious. And not just in the sense that that's okay, that we should accept not getting paid in order for doing what we love or any of those kind of passion arguments, but rather that you don't grow a creative sector the same way you grow a non-creative sector. The ide- ideas of like supply and demand and competition don't work the same way. Like if you open a, if you want to open a cafe, you can look at a suburb and be like, well, how much money do people make? How many people are here? How many other cafes are there? When you're making a video game or, or any creative thing, you don't know what taste is going to be in half an hour or what game some random streamer is going to play at just the right time. The Untitled Goose game, people didn't know they were going to be famous. Neither did the Cult of the Lamb people. And the people who that we haven't heard of who didn't become famous didn't know they wouldn't be famous. And so there's very different risk-reward calculations in a creative field. But that that idea of like to become famous or to succeed is is required i think needs needs a step back as well because um you know i think there is this idea that the only valuable independent game the only valuable piece of art is one that makes money or is is considered commercially viable and i feel like that can be such a flawed concept that i think so many people get trapped into uh when they work in a creative field like particularly in games as well when you have to pitch to um people to distribute your game or to to different companies that you need to partner with for funding and there is this idea of like is this a commercially viable product that always comes into the equation totally and that's been a big challenge for game developers especially in the previous well i mean it's not even just i was just going to say the morrison era but it's been like this for 20 well 30 40 years under neoliberalism like jobs in growth right like so like if the game industry the way the game industry got credibility even as a cultural sector is we make so much money like we're bigger than film we're bigger than music and so when it came to actually trying to convince a cultural funding body or public government institution to um look after games at all the argument was always you can get jobs and you can get money if you support this sector and that made total sense for like lobby groups and developers to make that argument because you're trying to get money out of the government Um, but the short-sightedness of that is that you then end up with funding programs, which are like, how many jobs are you going to create if you give you this money? And what's been really, really great about some of the more recent um, indie successes in Australia, especially House House, is they are very, very explicit about not wanting to grow. Um, and to use another music analogy, if you're an indie four-piece rock band, you have a really successful album, you don't go and hire 50 more drummers. You, c- you kind of hire people behind the scenes, though. So, like, the exactly. music analogy yeah. is is sort of fascinating because I've seen that same sort of argument for justifying like investment into the music community in, in, in a Melbourne context as well. So we've had multiple um, years of Music Victoria and, and other bodies um, doing surveys uh, to kind of work out how many music venues we have, who is the music audience, how much money is generated a night into music on an average, so that we can work out how many millions of dollars flow into the local economy. And that's why you should support musicians in your city and it's it, it becomes that sort of that same sort of issue that we have with games where it's like unless there is a value of money coming back into um the economy is it really a valuable thing to pursue is the art of making the music itself less valuable than the money that's generated by the live music venues that it sustains for example absolutely um but i think the difference would be in games until very recently but in, in music, even in that kind of neoliberal context of this needs to come back to economic value, there's still that ability to think more broadly than just who is employed at this one company that was successful. There is that ability to think of a cultural value insofar as the nightlife of a city or people are going to go one and want to see this band live or um, 
hey, maybe they'll hire an orchestra for one night, uh, you know, to do a big gig. Whereas until very recently in games, it was this company, if we give them money, will they hire more people? And so, so even within the neoliberal context before we abolish capitalism or what have you, even if you're dealing with governments that need to think about the jobs and growth rhetoric, which even labor still has to, of course, um, is you can still think of that in a more holistic way. And this comes back to the creative sector not working the same as the non-creative sector, even if you're thinking of it in economic terms. It's, well, if House House is really successful, they don't need to hire 50 more people to still have a positive economic impact on the local industry. And so to bring this back around to the initial question, three, three questions ago about the cultural policy, what I think really needs to happen, and which I've argued in both this book and The Guardian and whatnot, is even if you're only interested in economic growth, you still need to be support- if if you are if you are thinking of games as art, game makers as artists, and the cultural field as intrinsically significant, you need to be funding the stuff that doesn't make money, but which is cool, is experimental, is edgy, like real edgy, not fifteen year old edgy, and is like kind of out there or or will never be commercially successful because that's how you build a scene, that's how you build um, a local culture and community, that's how that's where innovation comes from. Like you don't get house house by like asking someone to do a business SWAT and like, you know, is how many games like this are already on Steam. You could do it by giving four cool dudes who are close friends and really active in the scene a bucket of money to actually go make a weird game about a goose and then it succeeds. So like if you even if you only care about economic growth, you still need to support the weird shit. Essentially is what it boils down to. Um, I would also like to see art funded not just for economic reasons, obviously, but I guess what the um, new cultural policy provides is a space in which to even if you only care about the economics of art, to at least understand there are different economic dynamics happening in terms of how you make that successful. Um, in terms of games specifically and the cultural policy, it is both very promising. The previous government, to their credit, I think in a move of desperation, you know, finally gave Screen Australia money to do game stuff. The tax offset maybe is going to finally be legislated soon. And what's been really exciting to me talking to government bodies is it's no, it, it no longer just feels like state versus state where like everyone else being like, how can we be Victoria or how can we stop our Queensland devs moving to Victoria or whatever. But when you're talking to say a screen Australia, which um, full disclosure, I do some assessing for, um, or when you're talking to an Australia council of the arts or what have you, they can talk at the, at the national level, not at the, the interstate bickering level. And so we're seeing more and more institutional recognition of games. And that's not because these institutions suddenly realize games matter, but it's because they actually finally have the resources to be able to care that they matter. Well, we're, we're almost out of time, and I think that's a really beautiful place to, to leave it at for today. But I can't thank you enough for, for coming on Lightmap today to unpack uh, just, just a tiny portion of, of your latest book, The Video Game Industry Does Not Exist, Why We Should Rethink Beyond Commercial Game Production. I've been talking with Dr. Brendan Keogh. The book is out now via MIT Press, and as, as Brendan mentioned, it's available online. Uh, you can kind of just access it. How, how can people just read it if they want to read it? Yeah, so just on MIT Press's website, you just click the open access button, I believe it is, um, and there's just PDFs of every chapter on there, and you can just read it. It's a Creative Commons license, so by all means, send it to your friend. You can also, I feel like I need to stress because some people got confused with that. It is also a real book. It looks like this. You can just like buy it in places books are, are sold if you want to hold a book and scribble in it. Um, but if you don't want to do that, yeah, just go to MIT Press's website, find the book, and it should be pretty easy to find the PDFs there. Yeah, it's. I feel like we could talk for days about some of the ideas that you've brought up in this book about like a much needed intervention about how we, we talk about what is a very kind of still nascent and young art form that's sort of working through yeah, I'm trying to escape the shackles of, of yeah neoliberal uh, companies and and policies and dominance for decades that have sort of shaped how we think and talk about them. So thank you so much. No worries. So I'm just going to quickly say on that point, what I find interesting about games is they're kind of like one of the only cultural mediums, I guess, like native, for lack of a better word, of capitalism. We had film. Film existed before capitalism. Music existed before capitalism. Games are native to capitalism. There was no video games before capitalism. So we kind of had to figure out a lot of this groundwork stuff in a very different context as some of the other medium. And it does then make sense that as a medium, it struggles with its place 
within a capitalistic framework and then how people see it as as being valuable outside of that as well yeah totally yeah uh, thank you for so much thank so much for coming on to the show thank you so much for having me i've been chatting with dr brennan keogh a senior lecturer at the school of communication at queensland university technology about his new book the video game industry does not exist why we should rethink beyond commercial game production which is out now via mit press and is also out on creative commons so that means that you can go out there and read it right now online as well as find a physical copy at all good bookstores Sifter is produced by Fiona Bartholomeus, Daniel Ang, and Adam Christou. Mitch Lowe is senior producer, and Gianni Di Giovanni is our executive producer. Thanks to Omni Studio for their support of Sifter's three podcasts. You can find the links to everything that we've talked about on our website, which is sifter.com.au, and read more about the games and guests that we've featured there. You can also join the Sifter community. If you enjoyed this episode, share your creativity with others at our very chill Discord server. It's filled with awesome people. You can visit sifter.com.au forward slash Discord to get there. That's sifter.com.au forward slash Discord. Please share this show. It's the number one free thing that you can do to support us. Word of mouth is really important to small podcasts like us. So let your friends know if you like it and enjoy it. You can send them a link to make it easy for them to take part in the show. And we'll love you forever for it. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us and see you on the next episode of Live Map.